Hello, everybody. Welcome to our YouTube channel. As a reminder, this is not just a YouTube channel. This is also a podcast, The Real Alignment Podcast, where you can find wherever you get your podcast. If you don't want to, maybe you have that one day where you need to listen to the audio. That's where you should check it out. Marshall and I have an excellent guest, which I guarantee is going to interest some of you. Who is it today? Yeah, Sagar, we've got Isaac Dovray from The Atlantic to talk about the Democratic Party during before and after the 2016 primary. Anyone who's been following this show from the start knows that we've done this type of show with the Republican Party ever since 2019. So it's really awesome to get to talk about this topic with someone who's covered and met with all the personalities. So if you're looking for good Pete Buttigieg stories, if you're looking for a good preview of a upcoming Andrew Yang piece with the mayoral race, which we'll hear about soon, there's so much good stuff here and a lot of great stuff too on his relationship with Joe Biden and how we could all think about the next four years in that context. That's exactly right. And just as a reminder, you can go ahead and pick up Isaac's book at our bookshop, which is available in the show notes. Also, you can check out any book that you want there. It helps an independent bookstore during the depression right now and actually helps uh, our work here at The Realignment. So with that, let's go. Isaac Dover, welcome to The Realignment. Thanks for having me. Good to see you, Isaac. I've wanted to talk about this book ever since it came across the publisher Audible notifications because for our show, we really started by focusing on the ways that the post-2016 landscape was reshaping the Republican Party, the arguments about Trump, debates about everything from the Iraq war to immigration, all those different things were really shaping the party tied to really big personalities in this really crashing media place. So this book is just that that exact articulation, but focused on the Democratic Party. So there's a billion different questions that we're going to have for you. But let's just kick off here. If we're looking at the immediate aftermath of Hillary Clinton's loss in 2016, what do you think were the big arguments, quote unquote, they were facing the Democratic Party because the actual book is titled The Battle for the Soul. So that suggests there's actually something that's up for grabs beyond just, hey, how do we win the next election? Yeah, I mean, I think it was sort of everything was in the balance of the Democrats, right? Um, Trump's election was a surprise. It was a surprise to Hillary Clinton. It was a surprise to Barack Obama. It was a surprise to Donald Trump, right? Uh, and uh, <laughs> the, the, the book starts with uh, never before reported details of of Obama and Biden watching Trump win and what that was like for them and then how they start to rethink uh, how things went. Uh, and it traces uh, back a little bit how the Democratic Party ended up in this terrible state uh, and then obviously where it goes forward from there. But there, there are sort of two elements that happen on uh, on election night of the immediate aftermath in 2016. One is the Democrats are kind of shocked, not only by Clinton's loss, but by a lot of losses that happened. There were Senate races that they thought were in the bag. They said, Russ Feingold's obviously going right. to beat Ron Johnson, right? Like that's done. Um, and they were already starting to think like, is, is uh, Burr going to lose in North Carolina? They were like jumping ahead to that. They did not anticipate uh, the the Senate losses, uh, they, they thought they were maybe going to take the Senate and that Clinton would be inaugurated president with Democratic Senate. So like that's how far off a lot of Democratic thinking is or was from where, where it turned out to be. Uh, and that, of course, it was that, it was the House race. So it's like that initial shock, but then it's also causes them, ca causes Democratic leaders to think about what led them to this point, how things were, so th this rot that was there. And that's how you see Obama moving into uh, caring about redistricting and state legislatures for the sake of redistricting. That was something that they had been thinking about doing. He was gonna put some time into it before uh, they knew that Clinton would lose, uh, but that becomes a top priority of him in his uh, post-presidency. It's like his sort of number one political priority once before he gets to campaigns in, in the presidential election. And there you see the effect of uh, a lot of things, including in a big way, 
Obama's lack of attention for uh, the, the democratic infrastructure. AIDS described that as benign neglect, uh, and that's the name of the chapter that's there, right? Uh, and you, you look at just the numbers here, uh, the, there were uh, close to a thousand state legislature seats around the country that were held by Democrats at the beginning of Obama, the Obama presidency, that by the time that he finished were held by Republicans. That, mm -hmm. that has a big effect. A lot of governor's seats were, uh, held by Democrats when he came in and then by Republicans by the time he was done. The Democratic Party was in really, really terrible shape. And there, there are uh, conversations that I have in the book uh, from the, the beginnings of uh, the Democrats trying to sort their way out, including one with Chuck Schumer, who before Infrastructure Week was a joke in the Trump administration, when it was like, oh, they're actually going to do infrastructure, uh, that uh, Schumer is like, well, yeah, we can make a deal on infrastructure. Let's, let's figure out a deal. And, and you see that going on. The Democrats think, OK, this is this like totally new reality that we didn't know existed. And I guess we have to attach ourselves to that. It takes them some time and it takes changing circumstances and, and the way Trump was as president for them to start seeing that there actually is maybe a different way of going about this than just you know meeting Trump more than halfway. I wanna pick up on a quick phrase you said, which references just the book, which is rot within the Democratic Party's infrastructure, because as you no doubt know, a huge part of the narrative that I frankly think just isn't true and Sagar agree with me on this is the whole the DNC stole the 2016 Democratic primary from Bernie because it had all this power and it's nefarious. Just reading your book, the DNC had basically no power. There's obviously just the point that political party infrastructure over the past 50 years, since probably 1968, has just declined. But the DNC was in disastrous shape. So can you just comment on this, on that idea that certain people and on within certain factions of these debates we're getting into hold about the DNC. Because I look at the DNC that you describe, and I'm like, that thing couldn't have taken over a single primary, let alone rigged an entire election this season. Yeah, the DNC it was it was closer than the, to the Muppet Show than to anything that uh, could it could actually orchestrate. Uh, a primary uh, win for Hillary Clinton. Uh, Hillary Clinton won because of uh, the won the primaries because of a, a number of different things, um, and there was certainly bias toward her among some people in the DNC, including the DNC chair at the time, uh, Debbie Wasserman Schultz. But orchestrating it for her, uh, no, there was a mess, um, yeah. and uh, and this a lot of that again tracks back to Obama. He didn't care who the DNC chair was. And, you know, when you have an incumbent president, that's a big part of the job politically is picking the the uh, the party chair. It was uh, something that now Joe Biden has done with picking Jamie Harrison for that job. It's uh, for Trump. It was really important to put Ronda Romney McDaniel uh, mm -hmm. in there. Uh, and, and Obama at first said, OK, we'll have Tim Kaine do it. And Tim Kaine uh, then was finishing up as governor. And he's like commuting, coming in one day a week to do the DNC, you know. That's not uh, uh, a full-time approach to the party. And the party apparatus is completely committed for the first uh, couple of years to uh, essentially being a housing place for the Obama re-election campaign. Then the Obama campaign saddles the DNC with millions of dollars in debt, doesn't help them pay it off uh, after the 2012 race. And Obama just doesn't care who the DNC chair is. He put Debbie Wasserman Schultz in as chair because he thought it would be good for him and his own reelection to have a woman who was Jewish and from Florida to be on TV and meeting with donors. That that would be something that would, you know, all those boxes right. were uh, ticked and, uh, and, and that she was running uh, a really dysfunctional operation at the DNC was not something that he ever really cared about. Yeah, it's fascinating. People forget Obama barely won Florida that second time. I think it was like 0.8% or whatever. Yeah, it was like a couple of days vote. after the fact that it got called, right? Yeah. Right. It, yeah, it's wild. It's it's funny how much of like very pretty recent political memory <laughs> it just gets memory hold um, because everything seems like it's going so fast. I want to take it back to this idea of rot and some of the reporting in the book around Biden, Obama. Because to me, 
what the most important lesson that I would have to learn is sitting there, if I'm Barack Obama and our future president, Joe Biden, is like, what the hell just went wrong over the last several years? I remember Obama's favorite David, uh, famous David Remnick interview right after, and he's like, maybe the country just wasn't ready for me. You know, mm -hmm. like maybe it was just like big structural forces. And then it seems to me from your reporting and much more, just really Biden, Biden himself was like, no, this was a result of some discrete choices which were made by Barack Obama, by some of the Democratic Party. So let's talk about what that rot meant to each individual politician um, as they went forward and navigated the Trump years. Uh, well, let's start with Biden. He is the president, right? Um, and one of the things that he talked about in our interview was how um, he felt, and, it, and it's funny, it came up in a very consistent way in the interview that I did with him at the end of his time as vice president, um, sitting there in the West Wing office with him about a week before Trump's inauguration. And then again, in this interview I did with him as president and, um, at the beginning of February, where he talks about how the Democratic Party stopped talking to uh, people who were struggling, working class people, the people who built this country is the way that Biden would put it um, and did put it to me. Uh, and that there was not an attempt to do things that would make their lives better. Um, or at least talk to them in ways that would be directed in ways that they would feel. And Biden says that when you do that, when you don't give them an alternative, when you don't give them another story to connect with, um, that uh, not only do you lose their votes, but it allows uh, what to him was uh, the beginnings of Trumpism to creep in, uh, to uh, uh, talk about uh, that it's the immigrants' fault or uh, that uh, the, the establishment isn't taking care of you. And what he says is, you know, that leads up to Charlottesville. And then he said to me, and Charlottesville, of course, is a transformative moment for Biden, seminal moments when he decides uh, almost completely that he's running for president um, to, uh, and he says there's a direct line to me between Charlottesville and January 6th, and that it's all there. And that that is actually the Democratic Party essentially retreating from what it was supposed to be doing. Hmm. And here's a more meta question, which actually really matters. What is the Democratic Party? Because I think this goes to the dynamics of President Obama during his presidency. Because if you think about it, why is he probably not that into it? I'd actually love to hear maybe, I don't want to say armchair analysis, but what was driving the lack of interest in the DNC. If you're President Obama, you defeat Hillary Clinton you come from nowhere. You weren't supported by the party establishment from the start. You're running under this broad, and you point out, I keep really to believe in the narrative of there aren't red states, there aren't blue states, there's change. I'm coming from outside of the system. Why would he be that enthused about who the DNC chairman is during that period? So just why, what actually is the Democratic Party at this point when people are just not that enthused for political parties in the first place? Well, look, I think you got a lot of what was driving Obama to that way of thinking correct. He sees himself as uh, emerging outside of that, like, and, and party politics is kind of a game. Uh, what is the party, uh, you know, what is the Democratic Party is a different question from what is the DNC. Um, and, uh, and, and as far as what is the DNC now, it's a different thing from what the DNC would have been 50 years ago, 20 years ago. Uh, but what is it now is it becomes a place uh, when, if things are working correctly, and it's true of the RNC too, that they're helping, uh, essentially taking care of the, the back office part of uh, a lot of state parties, right? Providing resources, uh, whether that's actual money or technology or guidance on things, research, all those sorts of things that can be hard for state parties, especially in states that where the Democratic Party is not as well established and that are on the front line, places like, hey, Georgia, Arizona, that Democrats want to do well in, but that don't that haven't had as much uh, of um, a history of resources and, and backing. But the DNC can help there and can help in other places too. And to help, you know, in, uh, I don't know, I'm going to pick a state out of uh, had Wyoming. Like if you want to start winning state legislature seats in Wyoming, or more importantly, in a, in a state like Ohio, where a number of state legislature seats, if they flip to be Democrats, could make a difference in things like redistricting, because the majorities you know, could uh, are right. much smaller there. That's the kind of thing the DNC can be really helpful with, and the RNC too, and that uh, you see 
in the last four years that was a priority of Tom Perez. It's something that Jamie Harrison has continued with at the DNC. And then it's actually catching up to where the RNC was and where the RNC got to under Reince Priebus and continued to, uh, you know, we, we sort of pay attention to how crazy things were and like the kind of off the cuff Trump presidency. And that's all true, but you know, Trump wouldn't have won in 2016 if not for the work that the RNC had done to prepare. And that really outstripped what the DNC had been doing. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So as we're thinking about it and bringing it a little bit to the primary, what are the different vectors that are shaping the post-2016 Democratic primary? So you've got the early days, let's think, you know, like pre the halcyon days of pre-COVID. It fascinates me that Joe Biden and Bernie almost come at this from the same thesis of like, well, the reason why Trump won is he was able to, you know, a working class vote, the Democratic Party is left behind. But Biden doubles down on a moralism, hearkening back to Charlottesville, hearkening back, you know, talking about January 6th, all that. Bernie says, no, 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 this is about Democratic socialism. So let's talk about those vectors within the primary and how people within the party expected that to play out. Because, I mean, it's not just me. I think a lot of people were like, I don't think Joe Biden has a correct diagnosis thesis of what's happening here. That was actually the very first monologue I ever gave at Rising. Um, completely <laughs> wrong. He's president of the United States right now. So That's just talk about public that. predictions myself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wrong all the time, and people love pointing it out. So it's okay. that, that is one of the yeah. lessons that I learned from the 2016 campaign was, as a reporter, don't go on podcasts or TV or in print. <laughs> don't make predictions. <laughs> But that's okay. Yeah. You should do it. Um, uh, like this is all. This is what the part of what the battle for the soul was about, right? This was trying to figure out, and it wasn't just them. And part of the way that I wrote this book was structured. It, there were a bunch of ways that I had thought of doing it, and it became clear to me that there were going. To, this was going to be the biggest primary field ever. I should say. This is part of, again, why I don't make public predictions. I thought it'd be like 12, maybe 16 people. I remember distinctly in like uh, this point of 2018 saying like, ah, it's not going to get over 16 uh, to a bunch of people. Um, you guys can see behind me, it's a podcast. You can't, uh, they won't be able yep. to see, but there's a framed buttons on my wall there. Those are all the buttons of all the primary candidates that, that uh, ran. There are 26, 26. Including candidates. Gravel? Does it include Mike no, Gravel? No, because he didn't actually run. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you were so quick on the draw on that answer. You're I like, love no, you. Like, no, no, no yeah. I'm a purist, I, not Mike that, Gravel. Uh, yeah. No, it was not a campaign. It was a couple of uh, I know uh, the kids, the uh, kids high school right. uh, right. students who were doing that and who attacked me on Twitter whenever I dismissed the fact that they were actually running a campaign. That's fine, guys. <laughs> um, what I saw going on was that these candidates, the way I, the reason why I wrote the story this way is because to tell the story of the Democratic Party, it actually became kind of easy to do it through the like, OK, here's Bernie Sanders, but also Elizabeth Warren. And they're trying to figure out what progressives are and what their different visions are and how that relates to the Democratic Democratic Party. Here's Joe Biden is the more traditionalist Democratic uh, approach. Of course, how he's been acting as president is not that, but that's how it seemed the outset in 2018 when I started really uh, working on this book. Uh, and uh, then you see other things going on. Uh, here, Kamala Harris and Cory Booker, who are both Black candidates, but very different from like the Ob Barack Obama. Uh, here's Pete Buttigieg and Beto O'Rourke. And at that point, it seemed like Beto O'Rourke would be the more powerful yeah. candidate, um, right. who are like this new generation fighting to be in. Here, here are a, a bunch of female candidates who are thinking like it's not about the way that Hillary Clinton did this when you've got Elizabeth Warren and Kirsten Gillibrand and Amy Klobuchar uh, and of course Kamala Harris, right, like th th that are coming into this. Uh, and it's, it, it was to tell the story through these people and you see the different elements of the party kind of figuring out what they are and figuring out what it is. And is it more important to have progressive ideology? Is it more important to have uh, somebody who represents a new generation or somebody who is black or Latino like Julian Castro, right? Uh, or, or does it all boil down to who the hell can beat Donald Trump? And, like, and, and that being the driving thing for Democrats, Biden's argument at the start was that. I stood with him in Philadelphia. This is in the book at the rally where he kicks off uh, and he's got City Hall in the background and the Rocky statue off to the side at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And he says, look, we've got to do something about climate change. We've got to do that. But none of it happens unless we defeat Donald Trump. And that argument became central to his primary campaign. It's not the argument 
exactly that he made by the time of the general election because the coronavirus changes that as it changed everything and really reset his understanding of what his presidency would be. I said in the end of the book when we were talking for the interview that he points out the uh, Franklin Roosevelt painting that he has mm -hmm. hanging in the central spot in the Oval Office over the fireplace there. I don't think that he would have had FDR in that spot in the presidency that he thought he was running for. Uh, but now he sees himself as that figure, which is a, a surprise, by the way, to Bernie Sanders and to Elizabeth Warren. It's a nice surprise for them. Um, and it's a surprise to a lot of people. But Biden, who now, I think, you know, he, he is aware that his presidency is a function in part of uh, being Barack Obama's vice president, and, and so Obama. And he is aware that it's a function of, of Donald Trump and running against Trump. Quick obvious follow-up on this he, real quick. He really, he really wants the, the presence, his own presidency to have it, its own place in history. Hmm. So, so this is backwards facing, so I'm not asking you to make a prediction. So we're staying within the rules here. If not FDR, who could be possible candidates for who Biden would have wanted to have on the wall because Trump famously sele selected Andrew Jackson. That's a Steve Bannon thing. The metaphor is pretty obvious. Uh, the Steve Poppy Bannon was selected Andrew. Yeah, Jackson. I, I said it, and <laughs> I, I'm getting the yeah, I'm like, getting I'm yeah, getting like, the mythology here correctly. Steve right. Bannon puts Andrew Jackson up there because there's an obvious metaphor. There's this populist going against the establishment, against the sort of hoity toityness of DC, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Who would who would you imagined imagine Biden have put on that wall? You know, it's hard to speculate. Um, I, I could see it be more like a Harry Truman, um, mm. right? Like sort of caretaking and continuing what was there. Biden saw his president, it was like his presidency was supposed to be about getting rid of Trump and allowing for a reset um, and letting politics like reform around a wound is how I, I, you know, maybe he would have thought of it. Um, and uh, rather than this like, no, we're gonna define what happens in democratic politics now. We're gonna redefine this country. Um, and, uh, and, and that's more of an FDR or an LBJ um, kind, of, kind of legacy that he wants. Um, you know, it, 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 Truman, I don't know that you could go, he, he's kind of, he, he's got a, a Robert Kennedy bust up in the office. He thinks a lot about RFK um, uh, and he thinks about JFK and he, 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 he always, going back, you watch speeches from him in 1987 when he's running for president the first time. And he has the same line, he does this, the, this routine the same way as he did all through the campaign where he would say, you know, a lot of people, uh, talk about that speech that JFK uh, gave when he was talking about going to the moon, the, the one that says like, we choose to go to the yes. moon, not because it's easy because it's hard. And he says, there's another part of it that I always liked. And it's, uh, we refuse to postpone. I refuse to postpone. He's saying that from 1987 all the way through 2020. Um, and so I may be JFK um, a little hmm. bit as to, to inspire him, but the kind of like, as far as like Truman, linked up to FDR in legacy, like that maybe is where Biden would have gone uh, in relation for him to Obama. You go earlier than that in democratic politics, certainly it gets a little tricky, right? Like you're not gonna go into uh, Woodrow Wilson. Uh, On five different <laughs> levels, you're not gonna touch Woodrow Wilson. Um, that is most certainly uh, off the table for the democratic pantheon. So maybe here's like something- Teddy Roosevelt, by the way, also hmm. like who was not, a Republican in the way that we would think of Republicans today, right? No, th right. Those, are, those are some great candidates. And, and speaking of candidates, something I'm curious about, we referenced this with the massive field. I'm curious how that massive field and who won and lost, and I mean won and lost in the meta political sense of whose fortunes were enhanced beyond just getting a CNN contract, uh, given this dynamic. Because what's fascinating to me is that you have a figure like Julian Castro, the mayor of San Antonio, and during the 2012 Democratic National Convention, he gets the Obama slot. He gets the introduction to America and the party. He gets the long, sweeping speech about his um, journey. Um, obviously, the fact that he is uh, Hispanic in the same way that President Obama was African American was really important. Yet he flames out, doesn't go anywhere. By contrast, you have a honestly novelty candidate like Andrew Yang really come out of nowhere and blow up. And he might not win the mayority of New York, but he's actually a contender because of that win. You have a figure and Beto O'Rourke didn't end up playing out, but 
he was a obscure house member who became that top tier Vanity Fair and, you know, cover photo person. And then you have Pete Buttigieg, obviously, who's going from a failed bid to the DNC to a really like a first place, a close first place finish in Iowa. And now he's the Secretary of Transportation. So how do you think all of those dynamics will shape the way ambitious politicians will think about this moving forward? Because the script of what you should be doing really seems to have shifted on the Democratic side. Yeah, I remember sitting in uh, in New Hampshire at a diner with Pete Buttigieg in April of 2019. It was right when he was surging the first time, right? There were, after that town hall on CNN. And I've covered Buttigieg. I met him when he was first running for DNC chair and spent a lot of time with him. Um, and we were sitting there and there were like, well, I was walking down the street and, uh, <laughs> and people were mobbing him. And I said to him, like, this is weird. Um, cause I had been with him. There's a scene in the book where I'm in Topeka, Kansas with him in March of 2018, about a year earlier. And, uh, we went to, uh, outside the Westboro Baptist church, um, at which, right. Like the, the it's super anti-gay. Um, uh, and, uh, and, um, uh, he's walking around and nobody even knows that he's there because who cares who this guy is. I've got pictures of him on my phone of him like on his phone taking pictures of the Westboro Baptist Church. Um, and then he's mobbed on the streets of New Hampshire. I said, is this all because of Donald Trump uh, that you're that this is happening? Is that what gave you that? And he says to me, it's very Buddha Judge Webb. Well, I hope it's not all Donald Trump. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, and then says, it's all these other things that are going on. But, you know, I think he's not, well, it was not giving Trump as much credit for changing how uh, things went. And he, um, and that's true for everybody. Would Beto O'Rourke have been somebody that we took seriously? It's a, a three-term congressman, I believe. Um, he just lost a Senate race, and then it was like, this guy's supposed to be a leading presidential candidate. Right? That never would have happened 20 years ago. Uh, but it's it, it's Trump, but it's also how politics change, how media change, how people can get through in all sorts of different ways, and what people are looking for in politicians. Right. Yeah. Um, and, but but I think there's also there, one of the people who ran for president had the story in the book and we actually cut it because we were running a little bit long. But um, there's, one of the people who ran for president said to me, I won't tell you which one, that, look, for any other job in politics, city council, mayor, governor, senate, whatever, house, um, it's like a job interview. Right. Uh, people look at your resume and they want to say, what have you done? I do with and this person said to me with president. It's how do you feel? Right. Yes. And there's that that's so powerful. And so that's why, you know, Buddha Judge, and we'll use that example, right? Like people were like really into he seems smart and with it and young and interesting and all these things. And like they weren't thinking like, okay, so how is it gonna work that a mayor of South Bend, Indiana um, is gonna be the president of the United States? I spent on that same trip and, and that where when I talked with him that day in New Hampshire, um, I had been going around and saying to people, like Pete Buttigieg, like for real, for president of the United States. Um, and uh, and they were like, yeah, I can see it. I like him. I feel good about it. And I was like, oh, if it's, uh, you know, there's an emergency and it's a, you know, the presidential seal on screen and then it wipes away and there's Pete Buttigieg behind the desk in the Oval Office. And they said, yeah, I think so. It's amazing, yeah. right? It's like that is a political. I see. I actually think all politics has always been that um, and that we've deluded ourselves into the job interview narrative. And I would point to Andrew Yang leading in the mayoral race of New York, or at least at the very top of the polls there, which is that I've seen a lot of the Yang gang being like, this is very, you know, this confirms that people of New York want UBI. I'm like, no, dude, people just like Andrew Yang. He's not, you know, it's like, he's like a smiling guy. Like it's one of these, it's like an affect thing, which I think Trump just frankly just broke through the barrier completely. But if we were to take, because obviously we can't test every single one of the 26 different candidates who ran for president, we're now sitting here in 2021. What do the 2020 election results tell us about which factions and groups got what right and what did they get wrong? So like maybe start with the more moderate centrist people like Biden, then the, you know, the progressives and then like the total outsiders. So there's a moment uh, that I uh, have in the book. There's a protest that happens outside the DNC headquarters. Uh, in it's a couple of weeks after the election. The funny thing about it, in part, is that the DNC headquarters has been closed down since the coronavirus hit. There was nobody there inside, so they were protesting outside of an empty building. But it's fine. It was That's a metaphor, by the way. And, right. Exactly. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, it's a Green New Deal protest, and it's attended by 
the members of the squad. Uh, and uh, not all of them, Ayanna Presley wasn't there. Uh, and a couple of uh, newer members who just won, Corey Bush uh, and Jamal Bowman. Um, and uh, one of the speeches there is that Ilhan Omar gets up and she, of course, leading member of the that new progressive axis of power in the Democratic Party. Uh, and she says, you know, my district had the highest turnout of anybody in the country, of any district in the country. And people have said to me, Ilhan, how does this happen? Ilhan, what are you doing to get people to turn out? And I say to them, you have to give them something to believe in. They have mm -hmm. to connect with something. If you do that, then the people will turn out. And yeah. that's what we did. And uh, and she goes on about that for a little while. Okay, so a couple of things to that. She did have a much more uh, competent organization than people were expecting her to, um, and was doing a lot of door knocking and that sort of uh, thing that, that is not what uh, often gets associated with like ideological candidates and uh, wherever they are in it, that like mm -hmm. the operational part of it was, was strong. But, in that district, which is in Minnesota, swing state, more importantly, perhaps, is the district that George Floyd was killed in, right? The district that was represented by Keith Ellison, now the Minnesota Attorney General, a very close Bernie Sanders ally himself, uh, before her. That district had the largest drop off in the country between the votes for a Democratic presidential candidate and uh, the votes for a Democratic House candidate. Wow. Which means that if we're going to take her formulation, and you have to give people something to believe in, what they were connecting with, what they believed in, was, it seems like, Biden, actually, more. And in fact, you see that all across the country, that there, Biden was running ahead of Senate candidates, of House candidates. Uh, the Biden brand was better than the Democratic brand overall. What does that mean going forward? We're not exactly sure, right? Um, because uh, is Biden running in 2024? He says he is, we'll see. Uh, who knows what happens, right? But one way or the other, um, there are the elections next year, right? And uh, do, we don't know also what the Republican turnout looks like when Trump's not on the ticket to pull people. Obviously it was much stronger for Republicans in 2016 and in 2020 than it was in 2018. Uh, but there is this question of what the Democratic Party wants to be now. And this book, right, is a story not just of what happened, but it is like, okay, so this is what you got. And these are now the themes that are here and these threads that are come together and these characters that are now part of all of our lives, whether it's Omar or Biden or Kamala Harris or Ocasio Cortez or all sorts of other people, you know, the, uh, the Gretchen Whitmer, the governor of Michigan, and what the, those are all these, whatever, it's a whole new cast of characters with basically the exception of Joe Biden than were there in 2016 for the Democrats. And this is this becomes a story about what the Democrat, how the Democratic Party got to be what it is, and where where that means it's going, and you know, I, I think that that'll be interesting for a lot of people, for Democrats especially, for Republicans. It also it, it's like this is what you're up against. This is what they are now with like the the strengths that they have, and also the clear internal divisions that are there. Yeah. So for my last big question here. I think the point about Biden running ahead of the party is incredibly important because it should, separate from future facing predictions, it should scramble basically everyone's perception of a lot of those 2016 to 2020 narratives in the sense that, and this is not a policy argument I'm making here, Joe Biden is not socialism, at least, you know, off the right wing parts of Twitter. He's not socialism. He's not defund the police. He's not young. He's not change. He's not basically anything you could basically encapsulate from the forward facing part of the narrative. He's not the squad. He's the opposite of the squad. He's the political establishment. He's DC, right? You know, so what is everyone, you've spoken to basically all of the figures here. How are they just, how are they thinking about this, right? Because if you're a democratic politician, you know in your mind that the country's changing and that when you're speaking to activist groups, when you're look, when you're talking to Green New Deal people or the Sunrise Movement, they're saying, hey, look, young people, they're activisty, they're much more to the left, this whole like center-right country narrative just isn't true. Yet you just had this Biden win, where if we're actually looking at these effects, even if you're looking at the 2018 midterms, it's the centrist, moderate, 
moderate Democrats who are able to put the Democrats over the top. So how are just the players thinking about that part of the narrative? Because for me, it just seems like, man, if you're a politician and you're thinking of your immediate future, you really should be pretty frozen in place right now because it's unclear where to go. Yeah, it is unclear to where, where to go. Um, I think the, the, they're all kind of figuring it out. And by the way, look, as I said, Biden's presidency is not what he was expecting. It's not what progressives were expecting, right? Uh, he's, he's, he says to me in the interview that we did, uh, I'm the most progressive person who's ever been president. And he said it like that, like, just want to be clear with you, um, right? <laughs> um, and, uh, he says, he says, the way he leads up to it, he says, this is an outrageous, well, maybe not so outrageous thing to say. I'm the most progressive person who's ever been president. So the, the, but that's a knock by, uh, in what, not a knock exactly, but it's like a brushback to Bernie Sanders. It's also a brushback to people who are like, Barack Obama was so progressive. This is Joe Biden. No, you look at Biden's agenda, even like what, what he was running with before coronavirus, it was more progressive by the traditional uh, calculations than Obama. Uh, and now as it's playing out, like if, if if Joe Biden gets everything that he wants out of the next couple months with the infrastructure plan and the family plan, things that they're proposing, that is way more than Bernie Sanders could have ever dreamt of happening, right? And now it's it, it, at least the, the first part of it, the uh, rescue plan, the COVID relief plan is real. And it, I think people have not fully appreciated how much that in itself is going to change the way American life goes. But these other things, infrastructure, you know, creating family leave, the child yeah. tax credits, all this stuff, it could be major, major transformative stuff. Uh, I don't know where, uh, what, what a Democrat, uh, a smart Democrat would do at this point to say, uh, this is the thing that we should do. I'm hearing, I'm sure you guys hear from talking to people, and you know, this book, uh, closed up not that long ago, but uh, even since it closed up, I've had conversations with people who say like, okay, so what are we going to do in 2022? And I'm like, I don't know, you tell me. Uh, <laughs> and they're they're so. I was with a member of Congress last week who said to me, well, you're you're the one who wrote a book about this, and I was like, yeah, but you have to figure it out now. Um, <laughs> and uh, you know, it is is it about lighting up the people who want the sort of aggressive, progressive approach to things? Um, is it about people who want to tip that it fully into uh, democratic socialism? Is it about finding the Biden moderates? Uh, you know, you brought up the case of Andrew Yang, and, and that's, a, that's an interesting one. I see an article from me coming shortly in The Atlantic that uh, is not from the book, um, but uh, Yang is in the book a lot. And Yang said to me over dinner a couple of weeks ago in New York, uh, you know, when I got into the race, I thought, hey, I'm telling people I'm giving away free money. I thought I was going to be the left of Bernie. And now uh, the progressives just keep on attacking me. And it's really weird. Um, and he's like, a, you know, I don't know how much you guys have dealt with Yang, but he's yeah. uh, genuinely a little mystified uh, by it. Uh, and He's I, very I, earnest. Yeah, yeah. He's right. very earnest. Right. Uh, and, uh, and I guess I would say there, though, even in New York City, and I came up covering New York politics. Um, so I was born and bred in, in, in New York City and covered New York politics. Um, I, uh, I, I think people um, who are in progressive politics in New York mistake how progressive the electorate is and, and, and are surprised, what the hell? Like Andrew Yang is doing well. Part of it is the celebrity politics that you guys connected with uh, or we're talking about him connecting with. And, and uh uh, and part of it is that the electorate wants people who are talking to business and yeah. talking. And I mean, not he's just, pro cop. You know, he's he's, he's out really just and, like I'm pro cop. Like, yeah, and he says to me, you know, like I want to meet with CEOs and tell it. You yeah. know, like that's not something that uh, a lot of people in that field would do, and in fact haven't done. Uh, and you know what? Like it seems to be working with voters more than progressives would have yeah. ever wanted to be the case. And by progressives there, I mean sort of capital P progressives. It's sort of like establishment Identity. progressives. Yeah, yeah. yeah, no, but like in New York City, especially there's, you know, a, there's a group, uh, some of them are in the Working Families Party in New York that are, that are this like, that are a machine politics in a new way. Mm -hmm. I wrote an article when would that have been 2006 2007 that was like about the new machine in democratic politics this is when i was still covering new york and it is that it's not a machine in like the boss tweed kind of ways but there is this like a bunch of the unions that are aligned with it and 
and, uh, and the Working Families Party and others. And Yang is not part of that club. And part of the reason why he's getting as much brushback as he is, is because he's just not part of it. Yep. Yeah, I, I, it, I've covered, I covered Yang from the very beginning in many ways, oh, a lot of my career to the man, and I think you absolutely nailed that. So my last question, Isaac, is to you is this, which is that Joe Biden, what does his win mean to him? You spoke with him in the Oval Office. What you, you were referring there, if he want, gets what he wants, I mean, does he genuinely want that? Like, what does Joe Biden want uh, after he won the presidency, realized the immense power that was about to be like imbued upon him? Like, what struck him? What does he want for this country? Look, Joe Biden should live and be well a long time. I hope he is. But actuarially, he's already the oldest president. Yep. He's 78 years old. Um, every president, the moment that they're sworn in, it's the joke. They start thinking about their legacy. It's a different consideration for him. His mm -hmm. post-presidency will probably be pretty short, you know, just realistically, at least shorter than uh, than Barack Jimmy Obama. Carter. <laughs> who, right, or Jimmy Carter, right? Guys who were in their 50s when the, their presidency ended. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, I, I hope I'm wrong. It's a fact. Um, you know, yeah. um, and so there is this sense of legacy that is important, not just for him, like I want people to like say nice things about me 50 years from now, but as like there is a, a, an opportunity he sees here to do some things that he thinks now are possible. He has a sense of himself as the guy who's always like, finding the middle ground. And I trace yeah. in the book some, you can go back to interviews that he was doing in the 1970s and he's talking about that. That's my job, I find the middle place. Um, and he sees now that that's where things are, but the middle is so much different from what it was even two years ago, right? And that his job is to push things to that place. It's when he talks about how there's a difference between things that Republicans in Congress support and what has bipartisan support. And, uh, and, and that he feels like he's driving the country to that. People agree on certain things. Paid family leave, good example of it, where there's huge support for that in the country. And yet on the Hill, you can't find many Republicans who are at least so far willing to work with him on that. Even though there were a lot of Republicans who worked on uh, family leave to pass a bill- With Ivanka. Uh, that, yeah. With Ivanka Trump and Donald Trump, right? Um, so uh, Biden wants to, reset the Democratic Party, wants to reset our sort of political culture, but he also wants to have this bigger policy change, and, and that's the FDR part of it, right? Um, is he the last president of the, you know, post uh, of the Reagan era, or is he the first president? I don't know. Like, I'll leave that to somebody. Who Mathematically speaking, books. almost um, certainly. Is, <laughs> <to> <laughs> almost certainly, but I'll answer the question. Yes. <laughs> yeah, but like, <laughs> but like it, it, my point is, like, is, does his yeah. presidency end up being the closing out of an era? or the beginning of an era, um, I'm not sure. And, uh, and it sort of depends on what happens over the course of the next few years. Well, yeah. we'll, take you, we'll take you out there, Isaac, because you have a very busy schedule, but just to pick on what you just said, I think it's so fascinating that you're posing the question of, is this closing Reagan or is this something new? Which is, this was the argument for Barack Obama back in 2008 yep. and the fact that, yeah. and, and I think a good way, cause I love at the start it's of the been, book, how uh, you really go over just the implications of the Obama presidency for good or for ill. And I think the fact that we are still unable to answer the closing the Reagan era question means that that to me just resonantly explains a lot of the way 2016 and 2020 felt for a lot of people. So Isaac, thank you so much for joining. Seriously, you, love Isaac. the book, everyone. Go check out our bookshop to purchase it. And apparently there's a great Andrew Yang profile coming out soon, so you can find <laughs> Isaac's work That's at on the, the Atlantic. Atlantic. Um, but by okay. Battle for the Soul, I hope there's a lot in there to uh, enjoy. I mean, like I said, I, 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 because there was so much attention on the Trump presidency and there should have been, I'm glad there was. But it, it also means that there's this whole very complex, very rich, detailed story that really wasn't told as much. And that's what I really tried to capture in, in this book. And, and I hope you, I'm glad to see here. You guys enjoyed it. I hope other people will too. We're really glad that you did it. We'll see you later, Isaac. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.